a sample. She'll let you know. All right, you guys ready? We've made it to the last week of our five-week series about money. So I just want to thank you guys. You can give yourself a little bit of a hand because, look, if you show up to a church and they start speaking about money, sometimes that's enough to never go back to that church again, you know? And here we are five weeks in. And I apologies for all of you that thought this was going to be the first week of whatever we're talking about afterwards. You missed it by one week, but don't worry. Next week, we'll be talking about something completely different. Just kind of joking. Um, I hope this series has uh, informed you, shaped what you think about money, what God thinks about money, that you've been able to take an introspective look at, well, how does my heart hold on to money, and perhaps um, how can I maybe let go of money and maybe take hold of God instead? Uh, this week, uh, we're going to be talking all about giving money. We've looked at earning money, spending money, saving money, and investing money. This week, it's all about giving money. Uh, so we've got a video for you, just like always. This one's a little bit more of a fun one, uh, but let's go ahead and roll that one. Do you want this five dollars, or should I double it and give it to the next person? Double it and give it to the next person. Okay. Would you like this ten dollars, or would you like me to double it up and give it to the next person? Give it to the next person. Do you want this twenty dollars, or should I double it up and give it to the next person? I don't need twenty dollars. Double it up, give it to the next person. Would you like this forty dollars, or would you like me to double it up and give it to the next person? Oh, double it and give it to someone else. Would you like this eighty dollars, or would you like me to double it up and give it to the next person? I feel that I've been doing a good job investing. I would like to double it and pass it along to the next person. Would you like this $160 or would you like me to double it up and give it to the next person? You know what? Double it up and give it to the next person. Would you like this $320 or should I double it up and give it to the next person? Oh, I like it. It's yours. Congratulations. All right, so a little different than the other videos we've watched, which have some advice on how you're supposed to do whatever the thing is that we're talking about. This one's just more fun. Uh, but I, I want us to think about what if this were us? Uh, I mean, not in church. I, I haven't discussed it with Kim yet, but I don't think she'll approve us doing this game. But let's say you were playing this game. Someone comes up to you and says, $5, double it and give it to the next person or take it. Well, what would you say? Double it? All right, all right. How about $10? Take it, some take it, right? Okay, now, now, like at what level do you take it? Or, you know, so like if it gets to 300, what was it, $320? Like how many of you would take it at 320? How many would double it? Okay, how many of you, uh, what if it got to over $1,000? Would you take it? How many of you would still double it if it was 1,000? Okay, like for those of you that are still doubling, I mean, is there a point where you would, we would take it or, or you're just playing this game? It's like, let's just, let's just keep doubling it. Right, it's a million dollars. Yeah, double it, you know? Like, I think it's fascinating because I think for some people, the higher the number gets, the easier it is to double it. And for others, the easier it is to take. And I think it works reverse for other people. Sometimes it's maybe more easy to take the, the smaller number as opposed to a, a bigger number. Uh, I also would be fascinated to know what, what are you processing in your head to decide, should I take this or not? You know, like, what are you saying? Like, is it the value? Is it what you could do with the money? The, the only explanations we got, there were two people that kind of said, like, I don't need it, right? And that was their, uh, therefore, I don't need it. Let's go ahead and double it. But like, what are we doing? How are we evaluating whether or not we should take this free money? And, and do, you ever, do you ever think that it's yours, right? Like, this money is yours, so you're either going to give it to some stranger or you're going to accept it for yourself, or do you keep yourself distant from it and say, well, it's never my money, so then we'll just easily, you know, double it. I don't have to worry about the loss that I'm taking to myself. I, I mean, it's just fascinating. I think the game itself will probably never play it. Again, I mean, we're thinking of games for this Memorial Day, you know, night, day in the park. Um, but the questions you ask are certainly relevant questions to our lives, especially if we say, uh, we live here, God has blessed us with a certain amount of money. How much do we keep for ourselves and how much do we give away? That's the question that I want us to explore this morning as we wrap up this series. How much of God's money should I give away and how much should I keep? Um, there's quite a few answers um, that we've probably heard in church. Uh, even, even the past four weeks, we've, we've given some ways to take steps forward toward an answer to this question. You know, we've said things like uh, work to earn enough for your daily bread, to meet your own needs, to take care of your family. Uh, we've talked about uh, spend less than you can afford. We've talked about if you're going to save money, uh, invest it with purpose or save it with a purpose and not just uh, on yourself. Uh, but I, I've been careful not to specifically say this is 
uh, what you should target, you know? And th- th- in your life, this is how much should go to you. This is how much should go to others. Uh, but that's what I want us to address specifically this Sunday. Um, I also think this is a question that we all kind of have in the back of our head. If you have any sort of church experience growing up, you've probably sat in the church and a pastor has told you about giving money and a feeling is always, well, I'm not quite giving enough, right? There's, there's just like this guilt-induced, like, by the way, the offering box is in the back on your way out, you know, like, don't, I mean, do whatever you want, but I'll be up here and I can watch it, you know, like, there's, there's that feeling, right? Like, at churches where it's like, okay, I, I know I should, but I feel uncomfortable about how much or if I'm doing enough or if I'm being seen while I'm doing it. Uh, we don't pass offering baskets uh, because we don't like that feeling. Um, we feel that's not at all what giving is supposed to be. Uh, but I want to be able to answer this question today. Or here's my goal is uh, when I was preparing the sermon, can, can I understand what God has to say to answer this question in a way that would give me confidence that, yes, this is the right amount. You know, where it's, ah, okay, I feel confident. Someone else can tell me something else, but I know I'm keeping the right amount for myself. I'm giving away the right amount. That's my goal for this sermon. Uh, where we're going to go as our primary passage is going to be the, the longest section in the Bible specifically about money and about giving. Uh, it's in Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, his second letter. Some people say his third letter. We just don't have the second letter, but you can talk to me all about that if you want. It's 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and chapter 9. Uh, we're going to start just reading the first 15 verses of chapter 8, and what you'll notice is this is very much a fundraiser. Like, this is Paul fundraising for this church that, that he, uh, he's met before, uh, but he's asking them to give money to a church on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea, which is the other side of the world to them, uh, who's going through a tough time with famine. All right, we're going to read 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 15. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of a very severe trial, Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here's my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Clearly, this is a fundraising part of the letter. He wants the Corinthian church to give money. Uh, He has several different tactics and strategies. I think it's interesting if you compare his strategies versus maybe the ones that we've heard or the ones that we've pitched ourselves. Uh, right there at the end, it's uh, the, the justification, uh, why it's fair, why, why this um, isn't them just paying for someone else doing it. No, this is balance. This is equality. Uh, you help them, they will help you. This is how uh, God's church works, a justification of their gift. A little while before that, he's uh, appealing to their integrity. You know, you said you were going to give, you excel in all these other areas. Let's make sure that you follow through with what you've said. And let's make sure that you also excel in this model. And he starts off with that example of these Macedonian churches. Macedonian churches think like the letters to the Philippians and the Thessalonians, uh, the church in Berea. They gave out of their extreme poverty, and then they gave because they wanted to on their own accord. You know, so he gives, here's an example, appeal to integrity, He also says uh, the justification for why to give. Uh, But what you don't see is the dollar amount. (laughs) 
You know, and I feel like, I mean, I think I was even taught this, is if you want to raise more money as a nonprofit, you have to give people specific dollar amounts. There's studies that show if you ask people to give, you know, what do you want to give, 50, 100, or 250 dollars? People are going to give more than if you just said, how much money do you want to give? You decide. If you give them a, some sort of number to aim at, then you'll actually end up raising more money. Um, or if you've ever been like at a school fundraiser or churches do this for building campaigns, you build that thermometer, you know, that shows like when we get to the top, you know, then we blast off into our new digs, you know, or whatever the thing is. Uh, that's very much what we do for fundraising. Paul doesn't do that. He doesn't say specifically, here's, here's the amount that I want you to give. Uh, he's talking about other things. So f to start off, uh, he's looking past dollar amount and he's looking toward their hearts, towards their inner status is what he's looking for. Here's one of the verses that shows that. Uh, he just says, now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. This is in his appeal to their integrity. Hey, you've promised that you will give. You said, yes, I want to give. Now make sure that you actually bring some so it's not just words, it's your actions as well. But he says in that last verse, according to your means. So I just want to make sure you are being whole, that you're being honest and truthful in this, and then that that would just adjust based on whatever your means are. So the answer to our question, how much of God's money should I give away and how much should I keep, uh, at least from this passage, is probably not going to be a number, but it's going to be some status in our heart, right? How, when we're a certain way positioned. Uh, but the, the answers that I hear generally for how to how to answer the question would be, well, you give until you start giving a little bit and you give until you reach this point. Um, in my history, uh, a favorite way to answer one of those questions is you say, give until you've given 10%. So that, that goes back to this 10% tithe, which is a biblical concept. It's an Old Testament concept where the Israelites, that's God's special people that he created. This is before Jesus' time and he set up rules for how they're supposed to live. He said, take 10% of whatever profits you make, give those to the Levites. The Levites were the tribe that was set apart to serve in the temple and to take care of it, live there, to do the sacrifices. And so many churches say, oh, great, great example. So you should give 10% of what you have to the people who run the temple, so that's the church. Great, give 10% to the church and we're all good. Um, I think it's way more complex than that. If you read the Old Testament law, that wasn't the only tithe they had. So every year they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, and they were supposed to bring a tithe for the Feast of Tabernacles. Also, every third year and every sixth year, there was a special tithe for charity, just for the foreigners, the widows, the orphans that lived among them. And so if you want to add up all the different tithes that are prescribed in the Old Testament, you get somewhere closer to 23%. And I haven't heard a church say that. Um, you should give 23%. Perhaps they need to say 10% to the church and somewhere 13% to other people around. But no, no one said that. Uh, but that's at least biblical if we're going on the model based on the Old Testament tithing passages. Uh, now, if you feel that's too much, the good news is the New Testament doesn't talk about the tithe. That goes away. There's, there's no mention of it. Paul doesn't appeal to it. He does, you know, Corinthian church, you know, take part of your tithe and give it over here. We'll earmark it for this. Or he doesn't say go beyond your tithe for this gift. The tithe concept is gone. Because when Jesus came, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law, meaning the Old Testament law, but to fulfill it. Now, here's the bad news if you think 23 is too high. When Jesus came to fulfill the law in all other areas, he raised the standard of what the law said. So, in all areas, oh, no, that's good. We're good. We got it. We got it. We got it. We got it. In, in all areas, Jesus raises the standard when you think about anger and you think about lust. And he's saying, yeah, you can't even think it in your heart. Or if you hate someone in your head, it's the same thing as murder. And then you go look at how Jesus teaches and interacts with people with giving their money. What percent, what percent was he asking people to give? 
right? He, he went to a tax collector's house one time, a guy named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, he was a rich man, but he gave his life fully. And he said, I want to follow you, Jesus. And on his own accord, he said, I will give a certain percentage of my possessions away to the poor. And Jesus praised him and said, the kingdom of God has come to this man today. Do you know what percent he gave to the poor or gave away? It was 50%. Higher than 23, I'll give you that. And then you probably know that there's that story of the rich young ruler where he says that this young guy, rich guy, comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to get into the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says, uh, well, you gotta follow the law. Right? He said, oh, easy, I've done that since I was a boy. Jesus says, you lack one thing. First, go and sell all your possessions <laughs> and give to the poor, then come and follow me. And he couldn't do that. You know, and give everything, that's 100%. And then a couple chapters later, I'm in Luke. This is Luke 21 now. Uh, there, there's a woman that he sees giving money at the temple. He stops his disciples and he says, look, that woman's giving more than anyone else. She gave two small copper coins, but it's everything she had to live off of. Again, that's, I don't know what percentage, but certainly high all the way up to 100%. So if we wanna go based on a biblical model of a number of how much we're supposed to give, I don't think we're gonna land any place where we're gonna feel comfortable. Because even if we say 10%, you're gonna realize, well, it's kind of more. Ooh, it's kind of more and more. Even if you go all the way up to 100%, the disciples, after that happened with the rich young ruler, they said, well, what about us? I mean, we've, we've given everything, I think, right? You know, it's like, well, please tell us that we're in. Like, we're, we're trying to give everything. The answer to this question, give until, it's not gonna be a percent. It's not, you're not going to find it. You can search as much as you want in the Bible for this is the biblical number or churches can say this is your biblical number. That just has to be a guideline. God does not desire us to hit a certain amount or to say you're gonna split your money this much, 50%, right? You get to keep half, do whatever you want with it and then you get to give away 50%. He's looking much more differently. Here's how I would answer this question. How much of God's money should I give away? And how much should I keep? If I'm gonna start by saying give until, I would want to model my giving after that church, those churches in Macedonia. Give until you give joyfully. I didn't mean to show you that yet, but here's where I'm pulling it from. Verse two, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. I think this should be the standard that we have for how much should we give? Well, let's give until we give joyfully. Now, I think you're probably like, well, I don't really give joyfully. <laughs> you know, like you even told me, like churches make me feel guilty and out of obligation. When I give, uh, I just give a little bit. How is giving more gonna actually turn me more joyful? Won't it just make me more resentful of the church and pastors and nonprofits and whoever else I'm giving to, homeless people, whatever it is? Pr probably, unless we're aiming somewhere else and not at the actual number. And, he, and here's the thing, L where does this joy come from? For those Macedonian churches, where is this joy being produced that we're supposed to be aiming for then if we're supposed to give until we give joyfully? It says this, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. The Macedonian church first gave a gift to God. The gift that they were giving for this collection for God's people was the second gift that they gave. First, they gave themselves to the Lord. That's the key, that's where the joy comes from, where if we wanna give our money, whether it's to the church, to nonprofits, to homeless people, to whoever, make that be your second gift. Your first gift, give yourself to God. He's the one who's gonna provide the joy. He's the one that's enabling the Macedonian church to feel joyful as they give, even out of their extreme poverty. I mean, this feels almost like one of those impossible examples. They're extreme poverty and yet they give beyond what they are able to give, and they give that joyfully. That's not coming from them. That's supernatural giving that's coming, but it's the connection that they have to God. This is what we need to aim for. Uh, when we ask the question, how much should I give? Uh, we're very much wanting to know for me and myself, how am I supposed to give? Paul understands our giving as this spiritual practice where we're connected to God. 
right? So it's entirely on their own, right? So it's God's spirit then directs us how we're supposed to give, where it's not us trying to decide, well, how much should I write the check to or which organization? It's we're just being guided by the spirit through our connection with him. Because is God not generous? I mean, this is what Paul goes into. We, we read this last week before communion. He's the one who set his riches aside, became poor, and so that through his poverty, we might become rich. I think generosity is the single characteristic that we can most clearly express God's character to our particular city. You know, because we live in a very independent city. We live in a very wealthy city that takes care of itself, that looks good, that presents itself well. And so an act of generosity where we are willingly giving up our ability to look good or to, to present ourselves a certain way in order that others might, that, that says, well, you're not doing it. That's coming from somewhere else. Our God is generous by nature, leaving heaven to come with us. I said this uh, a few weeks ago. He doesn't just stay up in heaven and just bless us. He comes down to be with us in order that we might be made rich. Our generosity reflects our Father and shows the world who our God is. We don't do it first. The goal isn't that we show the world who God is. No, we connect with God first. Our first gift is ourselves to God and then allow him to show himself to others through us. And then there's a, another practice that Paul recommends that the church do. Uh, it's not in this first section. It, it bleeds over into chapter 9. It's all part of the same section, but this is chapter 9, verse 7. Whoa, I hit it like four times. Got it. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. There it is again. God loves a cheerful giver. Give until you give joyfully. But his technique is saying, uh, don't give out of compulsion. Don't give just because, you know, you're, you're feeling bad about this. Make, make a decision and actually choose what you want to give and let that be your heart posture. So here's, here's my recommendation for you, is if you are not giving joyfully right now, or if you're, your giving just doesn't feel as joyful as it should be, scale it back and just say, let, let's make an intentional gift. Or maybe even give yourself a rule and say, uh, I will not give spur of the moment. Like I won't give to a church on a Sunday, right? Or if, if you go, you know, working with some organization, like I won't give them any money until I've slept on it, right? Or I'm back in my own home and now I can have a discussion. I can pray about it. I can talk to my family about it. Okay, now let me decide. What you want is that your giving should reflect your heart. You don't want to just be giving obligatorily. Ooh, that didn't sound right. I might have made up a word. Uh, you don't want to be giving out of obligation. You don't want to be uh, giving based on guilt. Uh, make it be your choice. Make it be an actual offering that you are giving to God intentionally. I want to read this other section uh, in chapter 9 here because this path toward giving joyfully uh, isn't easy. It's not it's not natural. It's not like the, 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 re, the normal path. If you just give money over and over and over, uh, you won't simply just become more joyful. It takes a lot of intentionality. Uh, Paul talks here in this uh, chapter nine, we're gonna read a chunk, uh, talks about the connection between our giving and our spiritual health. Uh, and there's a particular checkpoint we have to hit in this path toward giving joyfully. Uh, let's read 2 Corinthians 9, verses six through 15. Well, see how I do this. I got to flip a page. I'll stand here. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. 
and in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This whole section is about God's blessing, about his provision. Uh, this particular passage I have heard uh, abused by pastors as a way of saying, here, if you give money, look, God's going to give you back more, right? Because whoever sows generously will reap generously, right? And he, what was the other? God's able to bless you abundantly. Um, you will increase your store of seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way. Uh, but but you're, if you're saying that, that you're giving money in order that God would give you more back, uh, you're completely missing Paul's point. Paul's point is trying to foster this heart of generosity and a giving spirit that gives joyfully. He's not saying at all, hey, here's, here's a quick little cool trick about how you can make more money. What he's saying, look, look in, um, I think I got verse 11 highlighted, yeah. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. The, the goal of God's blessing, the purpose of God's blessing is not that we would just simply enjoy it more. It's that we would be able to give generously. See, what Paul's discussing here in this chapter is not a quick scheme about how you can make more money. He's, he's removing a barrier. He's showing us that checkpoint we have to get to in order to give generously. And that, that checkpoint is our faith in God, right? Because there's a question we have in the back of our minds. Well, if I give money or if I give more money, I will I have enough for myself? You know, like, like, okay, if there's a split, right? How much do I keep for myself? How much do I give away? Um, it just feels safer if I kind of keep more, not saying I won't give it, but I, I then can kind of decide when I want to give it. If I give it away, it's gone. You know, it's like I, I lose the ability to then pull that back and take care of my needs. We have a concern to make sure that we're well taken care of. Paul says, no, 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 you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. No, God will supply what you need. It's, it's our faith in God that needs to grow in order for us to give joyfully. Like ask yourself the question, what holds you back from giving more? There's real reasons, right? Okay, so like, I don't think any of you are giving 100% of what you make to, to other people. So what, what's preventing you from giving even just a little more from wherever you're at, whether it's zero, whether it's 99, right? What, per, what is holding you back? I don't think, I don't think it's that you don't believe God is generous or that we're supposed to give money or that God, you don't think that God, God doesn't want you to give money. It's like, I think, yeah, okay, we know we're supposed to. We know it reflects God. We know that it's good to give money. I probably should be giving more. That's probably not what's holding us back. I also don't think what's holding us back is that we, you know, I don't think any of us think money is a separate entity in my life. I give my life to God, absolutely, and he has authority and control. He's Lord of my life, except for my money. I mean, maybe we might practically believe that, but we, we, that's not our belief. We don't believe that money's over here. We're like, oh, no, I mean, he has authority over my money as well. So what is it? Is it a lack of faith? Do we really not believe God will enrich us in every way, you know, bless us abundantly? Yeah, I mean, no, mate, what? <laughs> Maybe, right? I mean, because here's, here's, here's what I think the reason is why I don't give more money. It's because money's valuable. Like, like I, I can do things with, I mean, I do use my money. It's not like I'm just sitting there like burning it, right? Which is a felony, you can't do that. <laughs> so don't. <laughs> no, like, I know that money is valuable and there are things in my life that need money in order to continue, like shelter, food, clothing. I mean, these are, these are basic needs that I need. I mean, yes, also entertainment. We've talked about how we spend our money and how we decide how we spend, but it's valuable. So I, I mean, I just feel like I want and I can decide how much I should give and how much I shouldn't. And so I kind of like being the manager. And it's funny because it's like, well, Brad, doesn't that sound like You'd rather trust yourself than God with your money? And I go, uh, maybe, <laughs> right? Because if you trust God with your money, isn't that, that little bit in your, your mind where you're like, yeah, but God's gonna just give all my money away. And then I won't have 
uh, you know, it's like, well, then I don't trust God with my money. Like, maybe deep down at the core of all of us, we don't actually have faith. One, that God will provide for our needs, but two, that God will give me a life that is full if I were to give all my money away. Because money is valuable. There's a cost. If, if I give my money away, I won't be able to do the things I want to do. I won't be able to spend in the ways that I want to. Maybe at the core of my lack of giving, it really is, I just don't trust God with all my money. <laughs> you know, I'll give him maybe 10%, right? 20, okay, but let's, let's not be greedy, God. Yeah, interesting, interesting how we say that, right? So here's the, here's the catch. How do we, how do we then practice this? If, if, if we need to build our faith through intentional giving, uh, if, if we need to uh, understand that our giving uh, should be done joyfully, it should be a reflection of, of who he is, how, how does this look in practice? I said a couple weeks ago that when we, every time we spend our money, we should say a little prayer of thanks. Write yourself like a little liturgy where every time you, you tap your credit card, you press submit on Amazon or whatever, you're like, thank you, Lord, for this ability to buy this. I appreciate your blessings. I think we should also write a prayer for ourselves every time we give money. Because look, if giving requires faith, then when we give money, we are essentially saying, you are Lord of my whole life. We are essentially saying, you will provide for me. I trust that following you will actually lead me to the life that I want to lead. Our giving is no longer just obligation or just to keep the lights on at the church. It is our heart saying, you, Lord, are the one that I trust, not me. Every little bit becomes an act of worship. You know, we sing songs for worship, and, and those are words. I think we all understand that talk is cheap. You know, I think sometimes it's hard to speak uh, worship or hard to sing songs because we know our heart's not quite there in it, and we know that that's not quite there. Actions are more expensive. Actions are more costly. When we give, we're actually saying, I trust you, Lord, with my life. I want the life that you have to give me, and I let go of my ability to control and be the manager of everything in life. Our giving can be a deeply worshipful experience. Make it. Allow it to be worshipful. And allow God to, to grow you in your joy. Yeah, you're not feeling joy? Okay, Lord. Let me plan. Let me give you the amount and let this be an offering to you in faith. And I pray that you would increase my joy through giving it. May may. I become more like you in my gift. May that gift first to you be present here in my second gift to the church or my second gift to the nonprofit or whoever yeah, that you meet on the street or to your friends or to your family that are in need. I think, I think some of us at our church are, are actually incredibly generous. I mean, I'm thinking over 10%, maybe 20, 30% of their income that are, that are going away. But, but I think the number... Uh, isn't what we're looking for. You know, I mean, Christians could give 60, 80%. I mean, we see examples in the Bible where people are giving 100% or where Jesus is, is requiring 100% or praising people who have given 100%. The number is not what's important. You could give 60% one year and then 20% the next year just because needs weren't there. You're following the spirit. But when we say, give until you give joyfully, you have to check the status of your heart. So even if you're giving 60%, you might not be giving joyfully. And God wants a cheerful giver. Giving joyfully. So check yourself. Am I giving joyfully? If no, my recommendation is to slow down with your giving. Take some things off the plate. Don't, don't get, keep more to yourself. Think about it and let it be an act of worship where you invite God to allow you to become more joyful. And because here's the thing. If you are giving joyfully, if you're seeing your giving as this partnership of you first giving yourself to God and now him leading you toward these opportunities in the world, then your giving becomes joyful and then it becomes free. Because now it doesn't matter how much I already gave before or where, where we're at for the year or what our budget's looking like. We are just able to give based on what God moves within us. That's what he wants, that partnership that we have together. So check your heart. Are you giving enough or are you giving joyfully? If you're giving joyfully, you are great. That's what I want from you. If you're not giving joyfully, slow down, take a deep breath and practice. My, my, my guess is most of us are far under 60%, 30%, 20%, 10%. We're probably closer to the 0%, right? 
even if you're there, start there. You can still give joyfully. You can give $20 one time a year and it can be joyful. Start there and let God grow you. Let it be an act of worship. Let it be a participation with who God is. Like if you're, if, if you're a servant of someone and you're put in charge of their possessions, you will then take actions based on what they want. And so when we see ourselves as servants of God and say, you are the Lord of my life, then whatever he gives us, our giving will f- come into focus, we talked about last week, to the things that he desires in this world. So the more that we give God access to our lives, the more that he'll be able to access the money and the blessings he's given us in order to do his will within the world. And here's what we get. Here's what we get if we follow these practices. If we give first of ourselves to God, we give intentional gifts that are acts of worship to develop our faith, money will loosen its grip on our hearts. We'll be more free to give ourselves. Our our giving will not be guilt-driven. We will be confident and comfortable with how much we're keeping for ourselves and we'll be confident and comfortable with how much we're giving to others. The world will see God more clearly in our lives because we are giving in accordance with who he is and what his desires are for the world around us. And then, of course, we will have life that is truly life. This is the one that I don't know if we understand. I I think this is the one that our faith needs to grow the most. Here's what Paul writes to Timothy. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. If we are generous givers, God says that there we will find the life that we're actually trying to find when we're managing our money itself. We simply need to release it back to him, and we'll have life that is truly life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for what you've given us. For whatever it is in our life, for how you've blessed us, we thank you. We ask that you would continue to guide us. Um, May you accept our offering of ourselves to you. May we be humble enough to offer you everything that we have and not just our money. And Lord, may you connect us to the needs around us. Show us where we can meet needs, where we can do your will, We can be your character in the world. And I pray that just as Paul wrote to this Corinthian church, that others would see this grace that you've given us to be generous and they would turn around and thank you. That it wouldn't be for us to look good in lights or for us to be a model, but rather that your name would be praised. Just like the churches in Macedonia weren't praised here, Lord, it was you who were praised. May you be exalted through our giving. May much good be done and may the world know more who you are through our generosity. In your name we pray, amen. All right, we're gonna do discussion groups. We've got three questions like we do. We'll take probably 10 minutes this morning and then I'll dismiss you guys at the end. Uh, The first one's a fun one. Just at what dollar amount would you accept the money from the video? Share a little bit. How do you come to that conclusion? Uh, Number two, when has giving been joyful to you? And number three, what's your biggest barrier to giving more money away? Um, And I wanna just remind you, when we do these discussion groups, this is our time to practice loving each other. You know, so, so some of these questions you've probably uh, recognized are, uh, can go pretty deep. Um, give space for people to go deep and love them, empathize with them. This isn't the time uh, to, to straighten people out, but the time to empathize and to practice our listening skills. Uh, and also, uh, I've noticed that there's probably more people than we have the little tables to gather around. Make sure you're including everyone around you. So again, that we can practice here. Let's come together, let's share, and let's listen to each other as we discuss these questions. Let's let's take 10 minutes and then I'll dismiss us.